We are very pleased to welcome Sam Guimar, the MP today, and as it is Apprentice Week, we are keen to get his views on what the future holds for young people. We, along with hundreds of other students here, are working hard to gain our qualifications, but we know the job market out there is very competitive. Youth unemployment is at an all-time high, so what is the government doing to help young people get jobs when they finish college? It's a good question. Um, youth unemployment is um, very high. I think the numbers are something like one in five in the UK. But it's not just in the UK. All across Europe, youth unemployment is a problem. Um, in Spain, it's particularly high. It's something like 40%, I think. And um, it's a problem. I think Germany is one of the few countries where... Um, youth unemployment is under control. So it is a big problem and it's um, especially um, challenging when you've got people, young people, working hard at university or at college and expecting to come out and get a job. That's part of the reason why you study. Of course, um, college is supposed to be enjoyable in itself. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what, do you, what does um, government do about it? Especially in the case of the UK, it's been going on for quite a long time now. The numbers have been trending upwards for something like the last sort of five, seven years. And there are a number of um, policies in place to help um, ease um, the transition from college into work. I mean, the flagship programme the government has got is the um, National Apprenticeship Scheme. It's funding 400,000 apprenticeship places. And I think that's really good. Um, I think that's interesting because one of the big issues you have, if you're a young person, I experienced this myself, trying to get in, into the workplace is the age old problem was you can't get a job because you haven't got experience and you haven't mm -hmm. got experience, you're not going to be able to get a job. So the National Apprenticeship Scheme helps to deal with that and it's got real um, government money behind that. But you've got other programmes like there's a work placement scheme which um, enables people to get work experience from two to eight weeks um, there's a youth contract which subsidizes places at work and there's an enterprise allowance scheme where um, people who are um, young people who are unemployed but want to start a business can get uh, money from this scheme in order to help them start a business so together there are a lot of programs going on there to help young people get into work but it is still a challenge and one of the reasons why it is still a challenge is because the of the economic um situation in which we find ourselves in you know britain you know we overborrowed as a country we've got to pay it back and it's the same in europe as well but it's particularly um a particular problem here and while we're doing that you know and the economy is not growing at the moment and without economic growth you don't have as many jobs as i would expect but there are some jobs out there. I think the key thing is for young people to work out what they want to do and really work hard to get the experience, etc., in order to get employed. I recently read that a lot of apprentice places are going to older people. Do you think that is fair? Um, I, I think I, I don't see that as the problem. I don't see that necessarily as a problem. Of course, you know, um, you don't want people who've already got experience um, going on apprenticeship schemes that are ideally designed for people who haven't got experience, in this case, young people. But I, I think what you've got to focus on is, um, I think the skills that a young thrusting person from East, East Surrey College brings to the workplace are probably quite different to the skills that someone who's a sort of a more mature age, is a phrase I would use, brings to the workplace, what role they will play, the specific jobs they will have, are quite different. So I think the real thing is working out what you want to do. I mean, if you take something like mobile phone applications, which is a big industry now, it wasn't an industry 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that there will be a lot of uh, students who'll be, who would easily fit into that industry rather than some other industry. Mm -hmm. So I think the real thing is working out what you want to do and then trying to get the apprenticeship that works for that rather than worrying about, you know, whether there are some sort of people of a mature age who are doing apprenticeships or not. Um, the government is also um, raising the retirement age to save money on pensions. If people work in longer, surely that will make it even harder for young people to get work in the future. Will it really be a case of stepping into a dead man's shoes? No, it's the answer. <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it's definitely not a, not, not, not a case of uh, stepping into dead man's shoes. It, it goes back to what I was saying earlier on. When you first start in the workplace and you're looking for experience, you, you, you go into a training scheme. So if you were to join, I, I think I'm Ragged and Banstead, I've got a, quite an interesting uh, yeah. programme they are running at the moment, Ragged and Banstead Council. And if you were to join and you were to join, say, the Illegal Services Department, the work you'd be doing as a 18, 19, 20, 22 year old is very different 
to um, someone who is 67 who's decided to sort of work post-retirement, the work they will be doing. So I don't think it's a case of stepping into dead man's shoes at all. If anything at all, you could probably learn from those people in the workplace rather than uh, see it as sort of it's one or the other. And I think there's a bigger um, point here actually about the workplace, which is 30, 40 years ago, people probably, if they had done apprenticeships, they worked in an industry and they expected sometimes to work in that industry for the rest of their lives until retirement. And I think what we're seeing now is um, people are going to chop and change careers, they're going to chop and change companies throughout the course of their lives. And so what you may find is for a lot of these sort of people who are post-retirement age or still in the workforce, they're probably looking to do something completely different to um, what people who are entering the workforce are looking to do. A lot of my constituents who are like that, they're probably consultants, you know, so they used to work as engineers, you know, they've retired and they are consultants and they offer their services to firms who may need them. That's quite a different um, niche to fill. Whereas if you've just entered the workforce, what you want to do is you want to get onto a training scheme where you can learn and where you can develop your skills. So I don't think it's a case of stepping into dead man's shoes. Thank you. Um, so what advice would you give to students um, to improve their chances of getting a job? Good question. <laughs> Good question. Um, there, there are a number of things that you can do to improve your chances of getting a job because it is a very competitive uh, market. I think it's um, the job market is competitive when times are good, it's even more competitive when times are difficult. And I, I was speaking to a friend of mine who runs a small business and who employs a lot of young people, most of them in the sales industry. And I was asking him, you know, what, you know, how does he determine which people he employs and which people he doesn't employ? And one of the things he said is he ends up, he's ended up employing a number of sort of um, Australians, New Zealanders, mm -hmm. South Africans, etc. And I said, why? And he said, well, he looks for little things, for example, email addresses and he said the number of pe um, people who email him for a job whose email address is more suitable for Facebook than for the workplace you know Jack the lad or dope smoker <laughs> at AOL.com and he said whenever he sees something like that he decides that person is not professional enough I can't have them working in my business or sometimes he calls them to leave a voicemail um, to invite them for interview and it's a voicemail message that's designed for their <laughs> friends rather than designed for an employer. So the first thing I'll say to improve your chances of getting um, a job is to really understand the rules of the workplace and it's very difficult for those rules to be blurred now that we're all sort of on the internet right and also knowing that if you apply for a job an employer is going to search um, on the internet to see you know to find out about you so that, that how you present yourself in terms of your CV, your covering letter, but also how you're presenting yourself online, I think makes a difference. And moving a step away from that is obviously trying to get experience wherever you can. And, um, and I think you can't underestimate the importance of just trying to build a portfolio of experience. And it's even more so now that times are difficult because there are lots of people out there. So wherever you can get experience, even if it's one week here, two weeks here, three weeks there, I would say it's worth doing it. But there's also it's not just doing it so you get a job. I don't know about you, but I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. And that process of doing experience, um, going and doing different bits of experience is how you work out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Because no matter no matter you know what you think, most jobs are quite different when you actually get involved um, in them. So that's that's this, um, the next big thing so first thing is rules of the game the next thing is experience the third thing i would say is most employers who complain about graduates complain about um the level of english and maths that people have when they come into the workplace and being able to write not in tech speak but you know yeah, you, yeah. you know proper prose is important being able to add up those are the sort of the three things i think you need to master mm -hmm. to improve your chances of uh, getting a job Okay, thank you very much. And what do you think is more important then, work experience or part-time work? Well, I, I, I think the ideal thing is to get part-time work that pays, that is also in the <laughs> industry that you want to get yeah. into. That's, 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 that's the ideal situation. I, I would say what, what happens with a lot of people is these things develop. So when you're younger, you probably just do a little bit of part-time work wherever you can find it. And then as you begin to think, okay, I'm getting into, I'm getting to the stage where I want to get into the workplace, you've got to try to make time for some experience that may not always be paid, 
but actually gives you experience in the industry that you want to um, enter. And um, I think you've got to do both. Depending on your financial circumstances, you probably end up having to do both. Now, that's not something that um, you know you feel is ideal, but that's in a sense that's the way life is. I remember when I was um, in the sixth form, I, I worked as a petrol pump attendant for a while. I worked in a Sainsbury's depot for a while. And then I got to university. And then when I got to university, I managed to get an internship at a bank that was paid. So in a sense, you've got to kind of keep pushing yourself and challenging yourself. But that's really the big thing so that you don't get stuck doing any one thing that may not be ideal for you. And I think if I hadn't done those internships in banks, I wouldn't then have got the job I got when I left university. But in terms of where I started, I started doing the part-time work that actually is what sort of ensured that I could go out you know, on a Friday evening. Some of the part-time jobs on offer pay 17-year-olds um, 3 68 an hour. Um, 21-year-olds receive £6.8 even though they're doing the same job. Do you think that one's fair? I don't think it's fair. Mm. I don't think it's fair. If you're doing the same job as someone else, you want to be paid you know, the same, yeah. you know, the same amount for the same effort. But... But there is also another side to it, and I'm, I'm not saying there's something I endorse, but there's another side to it, which is, given that it's the big challenge that if you're a young person you face is experience, is it better to get the experience, you know, at that price than not get the experience at all? Because especially where there are small businesses involved, small businesses are very, very nervous about their costs. And if you sort of say, you know, if you can't take anyone unless you're paying them this amount, then you may actually find that the jobs are lost completely. But the ideal situation is that for you should, people should get rewarded for the work they do and you shouldn't reward two people doing the same job differently. Looking ahead, which skills do you think will most be in demand by employers? All the, all the evidence shows that people with good math skills and definitely English skills, are better placed in, in the workforce than people who don't have those skills. Um, industries come and go, right? Um, I, I mentioned sort of mobile phone apps, uh, yeah. just as a throwaway one. But there are some industries that are around now, you know, people who are engineers at Facebook, you know, um, that were in around 30 years ago. So it's quite difficult to predict what industries are going to be around. If you can predict it and you can get the skills for that industry, then um, fantastic. But I think what you want is you want to make sure that on the basic skills, you've got them to a very, very high standard. And um, But also, I mean, something my parents always said to me, which I, I think is um, very useful, I mean, my, my mother still says it now, is if you do something that you enjoy, it's very yeah. difficult to fail, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So find something that, you know, okay, you've got to make sure you've got your maths, you've got to make sure you've got, your, you've got your English, but also find something that you really enjoy and throw yourself into it and try to be excellent at that. And I think that is far more important in life than just necessarily trying to game, yeah. so game the system to say, oh, I've yeah. got to, you know, become good at Mandarin because of this. And if you languages are not your thing, you'll just be frustrated. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for your views today, Sam, and thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.